one of the things that we found is by people sharing stories, um, uh, sharing narratives, it, it really helps people to, to, to not feel alone in their stress. You know, when you realize other people are struggling with this too, it can really help people to, um, to settle down. And I remember talking to this one young, young uh, junior doctor and he was really struggling because he wasn't able to keep up with the research. He said, I'm really trying to keep up with the research, but I'm not managing. And I, I said, well, how many, how many research papers are published in your area? And it was a huge amount. And I said, if, if you were advising someone else that was coming through, someone lower down in the ranking of, of medicine, what advice would you give them? He said, I'll tell them it's not manageable. I said, oh, right, okay. So you cognitively, you know it's not manageable, but you feel like you should be managing. And when you realize that actually some of these things aren't manageable and other people are struggling with it too, it can, it can be a real relief for people. Hello and welcome to Different Conversations, where every week we have a different person from the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences here at the University of Westminster, talking to us about what's interesting about their research and what they're doing at the moment. And this week we have, in case you can't tell, a bit of a Christmas themed chat. Today I'm talking with a good friend of mine, Justin Haroon, from the Westminster Centre for Resilience. Justin, how are you doing today? Pretty good. Um, apologies for not being fully Christmas themed. Um, I wasn't resilient enough to get out there and get some costumes. We'll, um, we'll overlook your lack of um, Christmas cheer. Thought I'd I have to admit, I've, I've turned one up a little bit, having just done a teaching session and uh, putting it on for the students because it's more fun this way. Good. Yeah, but they, they must have appreciated it. I, you know, I like to think so. It's, a, it's all a bit of fun, isn't it? And I have to admit, the Christmas tree I did steal from my wife's office. And by office, you know, our other room in my small London flat. You run the Westminster Centre for Resilience. Mm. And you're the most chilled out person I know, <laughs> especially in academia, because our lives are very stressful sometimes. Yeah. I just wanted to start from the start, I guess, with you. Like, what is resilience? Yeah. yeah. So it's a really good question. And, um, and there's quite a lot of definitions. And it, actually, when we work with people, when we work with organisations or healthcare providers, uh, or individuals, we often start what do they mean by resilience. There's quite a lot of misunderstanding about what resilience is, what resilience isn't, the definitions can vary a little bit. Um, but one of the definitions that I like to use has a real practical implication. So it's, it's, it's about our ability to prepare, adapt and recover from adversity or challenging situations. And I think that's quite a useful definition because there are three elements to that um, and three sets of skills, really. Some people are very good at preparing. Some people are quite good at adapting. Most people aren't that very, aren't good at recovering. So that's often our focus area. How, how well do we recover? How do we, well do we recover as individuals? How well do we recover as teams or organizations? Because some of the recovery times can be a bit toxic. So, that's a definition of resilience. Um, other, other definitions people talk about ability to bounce back from adversity. Um, I talk about an ability to bounce forward. So you learn from the adversity and, and you adapt and you change and you bounce forward. It's about having grace under pressure. And essentially why we do this is to help people have more fulfilling lives. That's, that's a kind of key element to it. And another little sidetrack to it is around resilience for the ecosystem, if you like, the planet, you know, are, is what you're doing creating good or is it creating harm and trying to help people to, to do things that are, are, are good. Hmm. I really like that um, adapt and uh, recover and this idea of bouncing forward. I've never actually heard you term it that way before. And that's a really interesting way of putting it. We don't want to go back to where we were. We want to either improve and get better or recover in some new way. And I guess that must just be so topical at the moment, in part, hence we have you on, because this year, this COVID-19 year, year we've had so far, a lot of the talk has been about, you know, adapting and changing, but also 
a post-COVID world that might be very different to what we're used to. Yeah. And, and I, I, in many ways, I think that's what science is. It is, you know, something happens and even, even though you may have prepared for it, you're going to, especially with something new like COVID, like a novel disease, uh, all your preparation hasn't prepared you for this thing exactly. So we're having to adapt. And I think that's one of the things we're hearing now quite a lot. People saying, or oh, you know, the scientists keep changing their mind. Well, that's because the science is changing because <laughs> it's new and we're learning and we're adapting and we're changing with the idea that we're going to bounce forward and recover. So it, it is, um, they are three separate skills really. Um, and I think for us as a society, uh, whether it's you know a small society like a, a team in an organization or, or the country, um, how well do we manage those three things? Um, and that's, that's, what, that's, that's what we primarily try to help people with, identifying how, what skills do you need to prepare for challenges? What skills do you need to adapt to challenges? And what skills do you need to recover from challenges? And so part of the reason I want to have you on, there's a whole bunch of different ways I want to take this. And I'm conscious of the fact I have a very limited amount of time to take you down different pathways that I really want to talk about. Um, but part of the reason I'm wearing a stupid hat or you know, an exciting Christmas themed hat, and I have an interesting background this week, is very much about Christmas. Mm. Because we're approaching um, Christmas very rapidly, surprisingly rapidly. A bit too fast. <laughs> I know. You try having deadlines for posting stuff around the world for my family. It's, uh, yeah. Christmas deadlines have all passed. I'm already late on everything. Anyway. Yeah. As we approach Christmas, people find Christmas really, really stressful. Normally, yeah. why is Christmas so bad for for stress and like well being? Evolution. <laughs> uh, so, um, one of the things about humans, we have we have what I I kind of consider it to be a little bit like a Flintstone physiology. Remember the Flintstones? So our physiology is really designed for being a hunter-gatherer. That's how we lived the majority of our time on this planet. And we have this, uh, we have this mammalian physiology that is good at dealing with short-term stress, i.e. you're going to be eaten or you're going to eat something. <laughs> but that's quite short-term. You're either running away from something or you're trying to catch something, you know, hunting or being hunted. So that stress response is designed for short-term. Uh, the trouble with things like Christmas is our, our new, uh, neocortex, our, our, our new brain, if you like, starts to worry about things. You know, all the things that Christmas should be or that isn't. It starts, we start to worry things about things that are outside of our control. We start to worry about, um, you know, finances. At the moment, people worried about, uh, are they going to make people sick? Are they going to become sick? So all sorts of factors like that. And that can dump a whole lot of stress into our system, which is designed for hunting and gathering, that stress response. So, but we're having the same kind of physiological response whilst, you know, sitting at work or sitting on the bus or sitting on your couch. Um, and that forms a kind of loop that can form, form a kind of loop. So that triggers the body. The body then sends signals back up to the brain, so you're not feeling quite stressed here. The brain tries to make sense of that and starts to focus on all the stuff that's out of our control, starts to imagine how stressful it's going to be, and it can cycle around again and again. So, um, so I think that's one of the major factors that can cause stress at Christmas. And, and for, for many, Christmas is, is built up to be something um, um, kind of perfect, and um, this, this, this search of perfection causes human beings stress uh, because it's not possible to have a perfect Christmas. Um, but you always hear that, the, the perfect Christmas, even the narratives and the stories, everything's kind of perfect. It's white, it's snowy, everyone's smiling. And it's just not like that. <laughs> but there is a bit of us looking outside and going, you know, they seem to be having a a different time they seem to be having a better time they seem to be managing better than i am 
whatever that might be. And that can cause a stress because we know that, you know, comparing to others uh, can be incredibly stressful for us. We know that with social economic status and poverty, um, it's not necessarily how poor you are, but, you know, looking out, I mean, yes, not having enough money is, is very, very stressful. And thinking about where you are and how other people are doing is also incredibly stressful. So some of the cognitive factors um, that keep feeding the stress system. And presumably also um, something about, uh, I don't even know how to put this, I'm trying to think back to Christmas's past, but it's a large group of people as well. Like even when I wasn't an adult, I was stressed out about Christmas, I think. And now now I am an adult, I'm even more stressed out about Christmas. The turkey yeah. being cooked, the decorations being in place, post around the world, the aforementioned parcel to New Zealand for my nieces and nephews. Yeah. Is it is that is it just that kind of negative loop we get into, just worrying about things that, how do you put it, that are outside of our control, that is the major issue here? Yeah, I mean, one of the things to, to think about is, you know, what, what's, in, what's within your control and then what's within your influence but isn't absolutely within your control and then not what's not in your control. And if we spend all of our time worrying about the stuff that's not in our control, which there'll always be more of, you know, <laughs> always be more of that. Um, there's a great quote by... Um, uh, I think it's a Buddhist quote, which says, you know, you can try and carpet the world or you can learn to wear some slippers. <laughs> if we're worried about making the world perfect and carpeting the world, uh, that's always going to be stressful. But, you know, how do we put our own slippers on? And one way of doing that, metaphorically speaking, is to, to start focusing on what can I control? What can I influence? So, for example, you know, you've got to send gifts and cards half well across the other side of the planet. Um, you know how long it's going to take, you know, how, you know, when you need to post it by and all that kind of stuff. Um, and you missed that, Brad. You missed that deadline. Look, a little, <laughs> a little bit. Look, my nephew watches this podcast, all right? But yeah, just a little bit. Well, th it'll be a nice extra bonus after Christmas then, even better. <laughs> Sorry, Travis. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's, it's, it'll, be, it'll feel even more special because all of the surprises will be, will be had and then there'll be this extra extra surprise. So it's, it's a good thing. You've done a good job there, Brad. Oh, thank you. <laughs> so so that, that piece of focusing on what we can control and what we can influence. Now, you can't influence, you know, if something goes wrong with a post or something like that, but you can influence getting the thing into the post box. But if you're worried about stuff that's uh, spending too time worrying about stuff that's out of your control, that's incredibly stressful, you know? Yeah, and, and Christmas can do that to us because we start worrying about things that are outside of our control. I have to admit that I am um, such a, a cliche nerdy scientist that after years of, for some reason, uh, my wife and I always do Christmas lunches or Christmas dinners for our friends and family. And I do actually have, uh, you'll appreciate this a lot, I think, is a protocol sheet on how to cook Christmas lunch that we modify in advance and a Gantt chart for the day about what's in the oven at what time and what temperature. Because, yeah, I got sick of stressful Christmas lunches and burning things and it being horrible. So now we just don't worry about it and we plan militantly in advance. It works for us. That's what air traffic controllers do and it works for them. Checklists. <laughs> and you, because you've worked with all sorts of uh, companies that control, um, sorry, not maybe not air traffic controllers, but you've worked with all sorts of companies and major organizations with this, um, type of resilience work, haven't you? Yeah, yeah. So we worked with um, we've worked with the police, Gloucestershire Police. Um, we've worked in the NHS uh, across the board in the NHS, really, from midwives and obstetricians through to surgeons. Uh, we taught all the we teach the junior doctors at Guy's and St Thomas's, um, and then we've worked with business organisations as well, people like Microsoft, and we've worked with Ofcom and a whole range of um, other people. So quite diverse, um, diverse groups. And, and there, will, there, there is often specific things for that organization or for that profession, but then there are these kind of core things that kind of cross, cross boundaries um, that are drainers. We talk about them in terms of drivers and drainers. What, what, it, what is it in your world that's driving you and what is it that's draining you? I have to ask then, um, what are some of those classic core things that you see? Well, the classic core things are often, again, around 
things like how well am I doing you know am I doing enough am I good enough if you like sometimes they talk about it as the imposter syndrome you know am I managing okay um I'm not doing a good enough job um things like that wanting to do more 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 and it's always you can always do more you know in the modern modern working world um you can just get busy so that's a real common one um the, the other common one is into into relationships within the workplace um misunderstanding miscommunication um mis misinterpretation of what what people want so that piece and uh, one of the biggest ones is email overload <laughs> this modern modern bane on of our lives of uh, this constant email coming in uh, with often very unrealistic expectations about how quickly they should be answered <laughs> uh, which is stressful i'm wor really worried you've actually just described my job quite perfectly <laughs> Yeah. yeah, yeah, all of ours, unfortunately. It's, it's good to know that's actually quite core across different organisations. It's not just academia specific. Yeah, yeah, it's, it, it's, it's, it wasn't so much in the police. That was the one place that that didn't happen so much. They had different issues. Uh, but yeah, that's probably the only place which it wasn't. They didn't have such email overload, but they had a different thing, which is paperwork. They call it paperwork, you know. Okay. And so another thing that's really interesting, because when you look at... Uh, some of these big corporations that you work with or big organizations like the NHS, like junior doctors, like such a cliche of a stressful job. And then you yeah. look at, say, Microsoft, which is such a massive organization that you can find core things that you can pull out of that, that cause the tension, that cause the issues, that cause problems corporately. And then we can learn from that as individuals. And I guess, because I'm assuming if we drag back to our Christmas example, the reason we have an, a problem with our Auntie Mavis's Christmas pudding is not because of email overload, presumably, but there must be some sort of core overlap there that we can take on as individuals as well. Absolutely. Uh, one of the things we talk about people is, is um, our core human experience, if you like, because um, when we're stressed, I mean, one of the things, uh, you, you know, it's one of the things that happens when we're stressed is we become a, quite focused on the stress, on the stressor. Um, which is great if you're, you know, hunting that gazelle. And it's great if you're being chased by that tiger or lion. So you need to kind of, you, you, need, you don't need broad focus. You don't need to be thinking about how fast the lion's running or something like that. You just want to get out, get out of the way of the lion. Um, so our, our, our attention can become a bit narrow and a bit focused. Um, and one of the things that can help is to broaden our attention and they talk about this in, ter in terms of kind of common human experience or common humanity. And one of the things that we found is by people sharing stories, um, uh, sharing narratives, it, it really helps people to, to, to not feel alone in their stress. You know, when you realize other people are struggling with this too, it can really help people to, um, to settle down. I, I remember one case, we, we do this project where we take the doctors off grid so we take them into the woods and we call it doctors in the woods and i mean it is off grid there's virtually no signal there it's it's kind of glamping you know it's, there's no electricity and it's great and we do a lot of nature work with them conservation work things like that and i remember talking to this one young young uh, junior doctor and he was really struggling because he wasn't able to keep up with the research and he said, I'm really trying to keep up with research, but I'm not managing. And I, I said, well, how many, how many research papers are published in your area? And it was a huge amount. And I said, if, if you were advising someone else that was coming through, someone lower down in, in, the, um, in the ranking of, of medicine, what advice would you give them? He said, I'll tell them it's not manageable. I said, oh, right, okay. So you cognitively you know it's not manageable but you feel like you should be managing and when you realize that actually some of these things aren't manageable and other people are struggling with it too it can it can be a real relief for people okay and so it's all about just awareness then i guess and i like the way you talk about it being a kind of a what was the word shared humanity 
Yeah, shared humanity. Yeah, they, they, uh, kind of co a common human experience. You know, we all feel distress. We all feel anger. We all feel fear. We all feel sad. And actually, kind of becoming aware that we all have those feelings can be. Um, it, it loosens the grip of it on you. Emotions can kind of grip you, right? So you know when uh, when something happens and you get gripped by that emotion, whether it's fear or anxiety. I, I can't believe I've missed that deadline. Boom! Yeah, it, it can really grip you, and it can really just narrow your whole world. So, um, and and that emotion serves a purpose. And biologically, it used to serve us certain purposes. You know. You know don't, with disgust, don't eat that. With fear, don't go near them. With anger, you know, so it, it tells us something. It's, it, it's kind of given us messages. And as, when we can recognize that message, that emotional message, we can kind of make a decision, um, is this useful in this situation or not? But if we can't recognize it, if we're not aware of it, then it will keep driving us. So one of the ways I think about it is, you know, all our emotions are, are welcome, but not all emotions are useful in every situation. <laughs> so it's, it's learned the awareness piece helps you to differentiate between is this emotion helpful now? Or is it not helpful now? And if it's not, what can I do to kind of let it go a bit? And so then if we continue our kind of theme of talking about Christmas around this topic, when it comes to this, uh, this COVID-19 Christmas we're about to have in England at least, um, where we're talking about small groups of families that are going to be, if anything, probably tighter than normal in terms of groups of people bubbled together, which I'm, I was wondering, is that going to be almost worse for Christmas stresses where you're going to have a small group of people in a small space for an extended period of time and there's going to be tension and anxiety and pressure and then you're worried about how close can you get to people and there's going to be concern over... Uh, and we, are we too close? Are we too far apart? Do we have enough? Do they get in the right bubble, the wrong bubble? Yeah. Is yeah, it worse this year? Short story. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure. I'm sure for some people it is going to be worse. Um, um, there's so, and there's so much uncertainty. And, you know, I, I'm wondering, am I making the right decision? Am I making the wrong decision? You know, is this decision going to have a negative impact? Is this decision going to have a positive impact? And we're, in many ways, we're kind of fighting against our humanity at the moment, which is to come together, to celebrate, to connect, to hug each other, to 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 celebrate, you know, to really, really kind of be part of family, friends, to socialize, which is really, really important for our our health and well-being. So there's that piece, which is a good thing about kind of celebrating at Christmas. And then there's this other piece about well. What should I do? What should I do that? Should I not do that? Um, so again, if you think about it again, from that perspective of focusing on the things that are within your control and are not within your control, where well, there's a great huge piece now, which is it literally not in our control. We, we don't know. Um, so, so that will be an extra feed in to the stress of what's already there at Christmas, whether you know, you're, you're gonna burn the turkey or you know, you're gonna get the wrong present or whatever, or you're gonna miss that deadline for that postage, Brad. Um, You've clearly been to my Christmas with all three of those things. Yeah, I'm glad you got a Gantt chart now. So <laughs> must make things a lot better. <laughs> my wife would be very, very proud of you. <laughs> um, so, so it's an extra piece. It's like an extra layer on there of uncertainty. And then the people that perhaps don't celebrate together, there's then there's gonna be feelings of guilt and, you know, you know, I'm not seeing my parents or I'm not seeing my grandparents. I should be, or I shouldn't be. So they're, they're, all of that stuff is gonna be playing into this as well. Um, so that, that will have an impact upon people's stress. Um, I suppose one way of working with that, if you like, one way of helping with that is again, to, to bring our attention to the things we can control. What are the things? that we can control and that we can influence. So if we bring more focus to those elements, that that will be hopefully be beneficial rather than living in that, in that zone of uncertainty, which uh, we're not very good at uncertainty as human beings. Okay, so for my, my simple brain, because I am a very simple brain person, I think you know that about me, 
there's a lot of this that we can't be sure about. There's a lot of uncertainty out there, but it is uncertain. So we can say, kind of try and we can try and cognitively say, okay, let's put that over here, and here's what I can deal with, and then yeah. try and focus the best you can on that. Yeah, absolutely, and and that's that's a really big skill actually to to say, um, I don't know. I mean, scientists are great at that. Right, so, and and I think for so many, so many, and one of the things I think people have found frustrating at the moment is the I don't know what, because they're used to uh, scientific knowing, um, but they're not used to seeing the process of how they got to the knowing. That you know, that's kind of often a hidden process. Uh, so what they see is the kind of well, we know this, but now we're hearing more and more of we well, don't know, we don't know. Um, and that's quite a skill to learn to uh, to kind of recognize that you don't know something. I'm not sure. I'm uncertain. Um, and we see this. People will know will will know nothing about a subject and and talk about it as if they know about it. <laughs> and when you push them on it, it all crumbles away, and there's nothing there. They don't know anything about it. But being certain is a I kind of consider it a bit like a human addiction. We kind of have this addiction to certainty. Uh, so we try and make sense of it quickly and pigeonhole it. Um, but learning to let go of that certainty and say, I don't know, can be useful. And then and then bringing your attention on something, well, what do I know? What can I focus on? One of the things we teach um, as part of the Centre for Resilience is uh, self-regulation, if you like, breathing techniques, mindfulness. And part of that is bringing your awareness to something that you, you kind of is an anchor like you're breathing and that gives you a sense of like I can I can focus on that so that can really help um, with that stress level so bringing the attention to things you do know things like your Gantt chart are good things that's a good that's actually a good strategy what can I control what can I put into place that's so that's exactly what I wanted to, to talk about next I guess and I know this is too big a topic and too complex a topic for us to cover in five minutes now but what kind of things can people start to do or start to think about to try and deal with that is it is it just and i don't mean just because it's a lot of work is it just prior preparation is it planning ahead or is it is there other techniques like you mentioned that there is mindfulness and breathing that can really help people out if they do find themselves in a, an escalating spiral yeah so i think there are kind of um short short techniques and longer techniques so um, actually, the, sh the short technique really is breathing. Um, and because when we start to get stressed, one of the things that happens is we start to over breathe because we need more oxygen and we need more oxygen because we need more energy to escape the line. So that it can start the kind of hyperventilation, over breathing, which can then trigger all sorts of physiological responses. So a self-regulation breathing technique can really help to settle the system down. So it can really help to calm the body down, which can then help to calm the thinking down. Quite often people talk about, you know, think your way out of it. Um, actually, I think you need to calm your body first, calm your physiology first. And that gives your, your kind of cognitive brain a chance to, to not be hijacked or to, to become unhijacked. So in the short term, when things go wrong, um, taking three breaths is a good practice. Uh, we did this um, recently. Uh, we, we gave some, we were helping some of the uh, staff in the NHS. And um, you can imagine the kind of stress of the moment in the NHS. And you can't get people that are doctors to uh, you know, an accident, an emergency or an ICU unit to uh, go out and do some mindfulness. It's, that's not going to cut it. Uh, so we taught them to do this three breath pause whilst washing their hands. So they've got to do that anyway. You've got to wash your hands anyway. Uh, so if you bring in the breathing with it and then also bring in um, a, a feeling of appreciation and gratitude. Uh, so you create this kind of positive uh, emotional spiral, right? the fact that you've got warm water, the fact that you've got soap, these kind of things can help to kind of just put a, a little pause into that stress system. So um, that's something that we that I would recommend um, using breathing to, to disrupt the uh, stress response. And then there are longer term things as well. So taking, uh, taking a kind of recovery or, um, yeah, a kind of recovery break, if you like. So 
one of the best recovery breaks you could take is to get out into daylight at the moment, go out for a walk in nature, connect a little bit. So notice something you see, notice something you hear, notice something you feel. Again, really helping us to, to, to be human again. So things like that. And you can do that even with how you make a cup of tea. Um, and then the other element is around our social connection. We may not be able to have a, a hug with someone, you know, something we're not be able to see someone, but you can, I mean, technology now is so uh, fantastic that you can get online and have some really deep conversations. And I've been on a few um, pub crawls with my best friend uh, on Zoom, you know. <laughs> so it's, uh, you, can, you, can, you can do all sorts of creative things uh, using technology to kind of connect with each other. So things like that. So finding, finding the, um, the, 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 the activities. And, and the key piece with this is there are some things, again, that are universal, like the breathing one. That's pretty universal. Getting into nature, noticing light, getting into light, that's that, you know, moving, that's kind of universal. But then the other, the other things, the other elements that help us to, um, to recover, that help us to be restorative, um, they can be quite unique. And one of the things we do at the center is we, we get people to wear heart rate variability monitors um, for three days. And that measures their balance between stress and recovery or drive and recovery. And what's really interesting is seeing some of the stories of what people do that help them to recover um, and to, 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 um, to top themselves up, if you like. And it's really interesting to see some of them, like one guy that was washing his car, really helps him with recovery. Uh, another person was writing in their diary. Another person was pausing and having a cup of tea with this one guy, and it was um, singing, um, singing Madonna in his kitchen while he was cooking dinner. And you could just see this great recovery time, um, having hugs with family members, uh, doing meditation, doing their artwork, knitting. Um, so we start to see different things. Now, if you sat me with some knitting, it would probably cause me quite a lot of stress. But for another person, that really works. So finding what is it that helps you, helps with your restoration, if you like. What's restorative for you? Because one of the things that can happen at Christmas time is, is we, can, we can kind of sit in the chair and do nothing. And it's actually not restorative. You know, it's just, it's, it, you're just doing, you, you know, you're not really recovering. It might feel like you're recovering, but you're not. So what are the things that help you to recover and restore yourself over this winter period? Um, do the things that bring you joy, really. Uh, what I would have thought of as distraction, but now having talked to you, I'm going to think about it as refocusing. Yeah. About going outside, about things that I would do, about exercising, riding my bike, for example, is where I find pleasure whatever it is, it's just maybe giving yourself some time during those five hectic days. Um, yeah, absolutely. Even if it's just before lunch or similar. Yeah, yeah, and we see, we, and we see that. We see, um, you know, we've seen people what in front of a TV and um, some people are stressed in front of a TV, TV. Their physiological system is showing them distressed. Some people are in recovery. And um, it depends, you know, what they're watching, who they're watching it with, how they feel about what they're watching. Uh, but we need to be careful of um, just that kind of distraction switching off uh, totally. Um, you know, do, do things that, that um, yeah, kind of inspire you. Really. Did I have to ask, and this is uh, the, the, the last question, but I do want to round off on this one, I think, considering our topic of the day. How stressful is your Christmas normally? And then do you deal with it well? Yeah, um, so... As you could probably guess by the lack of Christmas decorations, <laughs> uh, I am not the um, the most Christmassy person in the world. However, I do uh, have a family that is pretty Christmassy. My wife's uh, my wife's from Trinidad, so we have we have Parang music on all the time in the house now, which is this kind of soca music. And uh, Christmas is a big thing in Trinidad. Uh, my my dad's uh, Egyptian, Muslim Egyptian, so we never really grew up with Christmas in the same way but she really is so she gets really into it uh, so Christmas for me is is not very stressful um, uh, it's uh, I enjoy it um, 
and I think it's, I think it's because I have very little expectation of what it's going to be like. Um, and then when it's there and we've had the day, it feels good. Um, because I, I, I don't build it up into, into something. This is what Christmas will be. It is very much like, ah, this is Christmas. This is nice. So it's always like a nice surprise when it comes around for me because I'm not really looking forward to it. And then I hear the Parang music and I think, oh, that's, that's quite good. And then I, you know, you, you smell the Christmassy smells and all that kind of stuff. So I, I suppose I'm, I'm kind of living in the present moment with it, really, and I, I quite like that. Well, unfortunately, that's probably all we have time for today. Um, so it only really remains for me to say thank you, Justin, for that really interesting, fascinating, sadly quite pertinent chat, for me at least, about uh, stress, resilience, COVID-19, and what our Christmas this year can be like, and even indeed how to help with that. I hope you've enjoyed this podcast, whether you're watching along on YouTube or if you're listening in on uh, iTunes, on Spotify, or any of, other, any of our other audio channels. And if you are, you've missed out on our Christmas-themed decorations this week. My name is Bradley Elliott, and I hope you've enjoyed today's different conversations.